scripture reading this morning is taken from Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. That's Job 1, 6 through 7. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and from in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Good morning. We're glad you braved the rain and made it here. We're thankful for your presence. We all know that there is good in the world. We all know that there is evil in the world. At least most people, I think, ascribe to those things. They're very big problems for those who believe in a materialistic outlook of life. For those who believe there's no divine power, no God, and we all came about by accidental means through evolutionary processes, I'm not saying they don't believe in good and evil, but it's not logical for them to believe in good and evil. If they try to explain all of the things that happen out of a person's mind and all the choices that we make as just accidental processes, then how is one better than the other? And how is this action better than that action? How is taking a life better than, save, uh, than saving a life? Or, or worse than saving a life, rather. You get all confused. There's no logical outcome to those who have no God when they discuss the question of good or evil. About every religion tries to discuss the question of good or evil. There are some religions that uh, say that there is good in a person, that there isn't any God. There are some religions that make it just a philosophical question. The Bible, as you saw just a moment ago, kind of gives us an idea of how good and evil works in this world. There's the picture in the book of Job, and I believe it's a historical account, where the sons of God, well, that, what that means is not what we call the sons of God now. We have been given the right through Christ to become sons of God. But back then, Job spoke of the sons of God that shouted for joy at the creation of the world in Job 38. Well, the sons of God, all these beings that apparently are otherworldly beings, came to meet with God. And God said to one of those who was apparently not on good terms with God, Satan, where have you been? What have you been doing? Well, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. And then you know what happens in the chastisement of Satan after that. God actually chastising God is Satan. And Satan says, I like your servant Job, except that you've put a hedge around him. It's no wonder he serves you. You give him everything good. If something ever went bad for him, he wouldn't serve you. So God gives Satan the permission to do a little harm to Job. Take his stuff. Take his sheep and his camels and his oxen and his donkeys and take his children but don't touch his life well after all that took place Job said naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return there the Lord gives and the Lord takes away blessed be the name of the Lord and so Satan was thwarted then in Job chapter 2 there was another of those spiritual realm meetings where Satan said, I know, I didn't take his life, I didn't hurt his person, but if you let me hurt his person, he surely would curse God. So God gave him the permission and said, okay, you can let him, you can, you can make him sick if you want to. You can make him injured if you want to, but don't take his life. So then Job got the boils and he scraped himself with the pottery sherds because of those boils and he was in pain. His wife said, why don't you curse God and die? But Job, in all this... Job chapter 2 says, as far as that goes, did not sin. Now what the world wants to know, and what we want to study this morning, is if that's an accurate picture. Does, does, uh, does good come from God and evil come from Satan? I'm going to assume that that's the case. But then the question that becomes for us is, how did evil get here? If we believe in a God, and I do, and there are evidences for that, and you believe, many of you do, in the evidences for the existence of God, and if you believe the Bible's His Word, that's another step in the right direction. But even before we get to that, if you believe in good and you believe in evil, just philosophically speaking, even before we get to the Bible, and nowadays we have to speak philosophically on some level to people because they don't believe in the Bible yet, and that's the way to get them to the Bible. That's what Paul did in Athens, and that's what Paul did in, in Lystra. Spoke philosophically to the people to get them to God's Word. If we're going to speak philosophically to people, we have to ask this question. Are both good and evil eternal? Did they both come at the same time? That is, they didn't come at all? 
They've always been. Will they both last forever? Are good and evil equal in power, in sustenance? Charles Pugh had a great article on this from 2010 called in big words that I have to look up metaphysical dualism and the origin of Satan. And basically I even checked with him to make sure I understood his article correctly, checked with him in person to make sure I understood the argument correctly and he said that I did if I can present it correctly here today. Here's this. If good and evil are equal and eternal, if they're both eternal then how do you know one's good and one's bad? If they're both eternal, then they'd both be equal, wouldn't they? And if they're both equal, then why do you define this set of actions as good and this set of actions as bad? That's rather arbitrary. Therefore, they can't both be eternal. That makes sense on a philosophical level. On another level, taking a step closer towards theologically speaking instead of just philosophically speaking, you posit the omnipotence of God. You say God is indeed all powerful. He's the almighty. Genesis chapter 17 verse 1. Or as Job would later say in Job 42 verse 2. I know that you can do everything. No purpose of yours can be withheld from you. God is omnipotent. He's all powerful. Well if evil is eternal as God is eternal. Then evil can't be destroyed and then God is limited. He can't destroy evil. And so you got another problem philosophically and theologically. Evil cannot be eternal. There are religions in the world. There was an early offshoot of Christianity in the Gnostic realm called Manichaeism or Manichaeism. I'm not sure of the correct pronunciation. But it posited that there were, was a, a duality. That evil was just as eternal as good. And in the Zoroastrian religion, which originated from the Persian realm, the area of Iran right now, and there are fewer and fewer believers of it, but in the Zoroastrian religion, they posited two gods. One called Ahura Mazda, who was the god of good, and one called Anu Mainu, which was the god of complete evil. And these were equal gods to them. That can't work, because deity cannot be restrained. If God is eternal and God is all powerful, then he has to have power over everything and that includes evil. So evil cannot be eternal. Then we're going to have to ask the question then how did evil get here? Did God create it? If there is a God and if that God is the God of the Bible and I believe both of those things to be true, then how in the world do we explain that there's evil in the world. Is it just a force? Is it just something that came about? Is it a person? Does it originate with a person? God presents himself in the Christian religion as a person. He is a person. He is a he. He is a spirit but he is a person and he allows us to call him our father. That makes him a very personal God. Not all religions have that. They have some kind of force. They have some kind of being out there. But not all of them have a personal God. In Christianity, the real God of the universe is a personal God. And in Christianity, the explanation of Satan is that he is some sort of personal being that tempts people to evil. Is, is that accurate? Well, how can we explain that from the Bible? Please reason with me just a little bit. Some of these passages... I went through just a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday night in a study of Daniel chapter 10. So I hope that those of you who heard it that night will bear with me for just a minute because the explanation bears a repeating right here in this context for this purpose. How do we explain evil? First of all, understand that everything that is not God was created. God created everything. In six days, God created the heaven and the earth and all that is in them. Exodus 20 verse 11. Everything that is not God is created. Now Christ was involved in that creation and therefore this pivotal verse that I'm about to speak of, it's Colossians 1 verse 16, it's speaking of Christ being the creator but it makes the same point. For by him all things were created which are in heaven and which are in earth, visible and invisible, things we see and things we don't see, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him and he is before all things. And in him all things consist. I don't know any clearer statement of the deity of Christ, the eternality of Christ, and how everything else has to be not eternal. 
Now in the midst of that, he said that there were some things that were created that were visible and invisible, and included among those were thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, the governmental forces of this world that seemed to work a little bit behind the scene. We noted how in Daniel chapter 10 there was this heavenly being that said, I'd have been to you sooner, Daniel, but I had to fight with the prince of Persia, and now i got to go fight with the prince of Greece. And you kind of get a glimpse into possibly this behind-the-scenes world that goes on behind the governing affairs of this world. And all that's for another lesson, but what's for this lesson right now is that phrase, principalities and powers. They were created by God. What are they? Well, let's look and see what else we have in the scriptures. It comes up a lot in the book of Ephesians. These, the heavenly places is only in the book of Ephesians, but these heavenly places or the heavenlies are not really speaking of the place called heaven. We determined because of Ephesians 6 verse 12 that puts spiritual powers of wickedness in the heavenly places. These heavenly places have the principalities and powers connected right with them. They're the place of the resurrected Christ. In Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 22, in the midst of that, about verse 20, he starts speaking of how God raised Christ to be with him in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion. It's where Christ is. Secondly, it's where Christians are after they become Christians. But God, who is rich in mercy, Ephesians 2 verse 4, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, raised us up together to be in the heavenly places with Christ. We're in the heavenly places with Christ now. And then Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10, the intent that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places. And then that exclamatory verse of Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 that reminds us of so many things. Number one, we don't fight with weapons of war in our, in our spiritual battle. And number two, that there is a spiritual battle. And number three, that there are wicked things in the quote unquote heavenly places. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. I'm not saying... Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that there is wickedness in heaven with God. There cannot be. That's the point of forgiving us of our sins so that we can be holy and purified and get to be there with God. But I am saying that the word heavenly is used in different connotations, just like we use words in different connotations. What does the word duck mean? Well, it means a little animal that's got webbed feet that paddles in the water, or it means watch out, somebody's throwing a ball at your head. We've got words have different connotations. So the heavenly places here simply means the spiritual realm. The principalities and the powers are in it. And then you have Romans chapter 8 verses thir verse 38 where Paul is trying to elucidate to people that they don't need to worry about Christ leaving them. He says, for I am persuaded that, ne that neither... Uh, angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He puts principalities and powers in the dominion of created things, in the category of created things, and he puts those principalities and powers in the category of things that are trying to separate us from Christ but won't be able to. So there might be evil in these principalities and powers, the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And then there comes this great passage, this fantastic passage in Colossians chapter 2. You probably know verse 14. It's one of the prime verses that is used, rightfully so, to show that the old law has been done away with and we live in the new law of Christ. It says, in the, picking up in the middle of a sentence, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. In other words, when Christ died, he took out of the way the Mosaic dispensation. He took out of the way everything about Judaism. He took out of the way the legitimacy of animal sacrifices, the legitimacy of the Passover, the legitimacy of the temple in Jerusalem. He took all that out of the way. He changed the whole system of living, the whole economy of those people, and the whole spiritual economy, if you will, of the world. It was all nailed to the cross. Something changed. And then there's another statement, picking up the same sentence, using that same figure of speech, having done something, he having wiped out the handwriting of requirements was against us. In verse 15, what did he do? Having disarmed principalities and powers. 
He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. When Christ died on the cross, the Bible says in Hebrews 2 verse 14, He defeated him that had the power of death, that is the devil. When Christ died on the cross, He disarmed principalities and powers. Everything that was working against God, He disarmed it at His great sacrifice on the cross because He showed all that goodness is there and all that deity is, verified by His resurrection three days later. So, we have the Bible as the Word of God telling us that there are principalities and the powers in the heavenly places that have spiritual hosts of wickedness and that these things must have been created by God because nothing is eternal. But that leaves us with the problem, did God create something evil? If he did, he wouldn't be the God you know. If God created something evil, he wouldn't be the God we serve. Everything else we know about him in the Bible would be put out to the trash if he created something evil. He didn't create anything evil. Genesis 1 verse 31 saw that at the end of the creation week, he saw that everything was very good. 1 Timothy 4 verse 4 speaks of every good creature that's free to be eaten. And James chapter 1 verse 17 says that every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God created things good. But God created things so good that there was a possibility of evil entering. God created this thing called free will. Free will has its ups and has its downs. Without free will, as Charles Pugh points out in his article, there wouldn't be really anything such as a meaningful love. Is it really meaningful if you buy a robot that does exactly what you say? Can you, can you say that robot loves you? No. But if someone chooses to love you, chooses to marry you in that sense of love, if someone chooses that, oh, you're talking about real love. But it had to be because they chose it. And there couldn't be anything such thing as real joy or real goodness without free will. But free will brought the possibility of evil the way it happened historically is that God set man in the Garden of Eden with all of these trees and he could eat of any tree that he wanted to eat except for one. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil that was in the midst of the garden, God said, don't eat of that tree for in the day you eat of it you will surely die. And it's not like God brought evil into the world. He brought fullness of good in bringing free will. He could have made us all robots but that wouldn't have been as good as he could have done. So he made us free will people. But he gave us the consequences too. He warned us. And then if you'll skip ahead into the history of sin through God's people, he would always, before any kind of punishment, before any kind of discipline, send them prophet after prophet after prophet to remind them of what was written in the law and how they were disobeying it. Well, God told Adam, don't eat of that tree. In the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And then death came into the world when they ate of it. And death is preceded by suffering. Death has all kinds of evil surrounding it. And then free will really got a hold of people. We all die because we all sin. Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Now, free will is within God's will. And then we have a real philosophical problem if we don't like it that God gave us free will, then we have a problem because we're arguing against God. You know how we're doing that? With our free will that God gave us. Now, here's the thing about evil. It's not eternal. It was created. It was created good, but then somehow along the way it turned evil. There will be an end to evil at some point. Evil had a beginning evil will have an end. I'm going to talk about the end before I talk about the beginning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when Paul's speaking about the resurrection, he says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of all those who have fallen asleep. For as in Adam all die, even in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order, 
Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his resurrection, then come or as at the end, at his coming, then comes the end when he shall deliver the kingdom, the church, to God the Father, and put an end to all rule and all authority and power. Free will would be encompassed in that rule and authority and power. Principalities and powers would be encompassed in that. He'll put an end to all of that. For he must sit at his right hand till all his enemies are put under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. When time ends, evil ends. When time ends, temptation ends. When time ends, sadness ends. When time ends, death ends. Christ has already defeated all of that in prospect by submitting to him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and releasing those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Evil will have an end. Did evil have, then how did evil get here? Wayne Jackson has a great article that helps with that, turning to uh, scriptures. There are passages in the Bible that seem to indicate that there's some sort of fallen being from heaven. Let me give you a couple of those passages that are used to say the devil fell from heaven that I don't think should be used that way. And then I'll get to the point. First of all, Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 speaks of Lucifer. And you've heard of Lucifer in common parlance of the day. Lucifer is equal to the devil. But it wasn't so in Isaiah 14. You read that passage and there's somebody fallen from heaven so to speak. And it's the king of Babylon who it is. He, already, he had things really good. As heaven is used poetically to say that you dwelt there and then you fell. And now you're going to be punished. You have the same thing in Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 11 through 19. Where in chapter 27, 28 and 29 I believe. The Ezekiel was speaking, God is telling Ezekiel to tell the king of Tyre, T-Y-R-E, the city of Tyre, you're going to fall. And he has a whole bunch of poetry to tell him how wonderful you had it. You were surrounded with gold and topaz and sardius and, and barrel. You were surrounded with all these great gems. It's like you were in the Garden of Eden. And then you fell. And so some people take that to mean the fall of the devil, but contextually, it's the king of Tyre. And then you have... Luke chapter 10 verses 17 through 20 where the disciples who've gone out on the great commission come back and they're really excited. They say, we, even the spirits are subject to us in your name. They, they recognize some spiritual world. And Jesus says, yeah, I saw, light, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And he says, uh, but don't be so glad that the spirits are subject to your name. It's better that your names are written in heaven. But that thing, if Satan fell like lightning from heaven when the disciples are going out on their great on their limited commission in Luke chapter 10 that's about 6000 years too late or so to explain the origin of Satan so i don't think that means the origin of Satan either and then there's revelation chapter 12 verses 7 through 10 and war broke out in heaven michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought and they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives even to the death. Well, that sounds pretty straightforward. Except that it's in the midst of a whole bunch of apocalyptic language that really isn't straightforward. And that again, I think it would be too late because it's talking about the dragon falling after people have already overcome him, it seems. But there might be something behind all of these poetic uses and apocalyptic uses. You know how sometimes people make up one story but it's based on something that actually happened? Maybe that's the case here. Here are some clues that we get that are a little more straightforward in more straightforward prosaic language. 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter is talking about false teachers and he wants people to know that God knows how to punish false teachers. He goes through several if-then statements. If God punished these people, if God punished those people, if God punished those people, but he let these other people go, then God knows how to reserve the ungodly for punishment and deliver those who are godly out of punishment. That's the whole idea of 2 Peter 2 verses 4 through 11. 
Well, in verse 4, the first if statement is this. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. That's the portion of the sentence that's capturing our attention this morning. And it affirms that God had some angels who rebelled. He cast them down to hell, chains of darkness, reserved them for judgment. Jude, verse 6. The one chapter of Jude has verse 6 that is very parallel. Matter of fact, a lot of the whole book of Jude is parallel to 2 Peter chapter 2. Jude, verse 6, says it this way. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. There were some angels, apparently, that got a little too full of themselves. And got a little uppity and thought that they should be a little more powerful than they were and God said no. But the angels would have been created beings because everything else was created. Principalities and powers. So maybe these fallen angels comprised the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Ephesians 6 verse 12. I think there's good reason to think about that. You also have 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 6 in the midst of the qualification of elders. The Bible says not to appoint a novice. Don't appoint somebody too young and uppity, lest being puffed up with pride. Here's the language of the Bible. Lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation of the devil. Now in Greek, the grammar can be used a couple of different ways, but I think the most straightforward meaning is if he's puffed up with pride, he's going to lift himself up like the devil did, and the devil got condemned. And if an elder pumps himself up with pride, he's going to be condemned too. Same condemnation as the devil. And then if you put those verses together with Matthew chapter 25 verse 41. Where Jesus says that certain people will be cast into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Pre the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Then I think we have a pretty good idea of what happened. The best I can tell, although I'll have to admit, it's not revealed just flat out dogmatically. But if you put all these pieces of evidence together and all this, I think, sound philosophy together, you have to come out that evil was created. But God's good. He wouldn't create anything evil. So he created good, but some of that good turned on him. And the angels apparently didn't have a plan of salvation like men did, like man does through Christ. And so God prepared the devil and his angels the everlasting fire, and warns that people will be cast there too if we're not obedient, thankfully obedient, gratefully obedient to the sacrifice of Christ. 1 John chapter 3 verse 8 says, He who sins is of the devil. And you know the devil has sinned from the beginning. Well, yeah, God would have made him in the beginning. But Jesus was manifested for this purpose that he might destroy the works of the devil. There is evil out there in this world and it encompasses people on different levels. It encompasses individuals, it encompasses families. It works out to societies, it works out to governments, it works out to world war sometimes. There is evil in this world. But here's what Christians need to know. You overcome it, not by your power, but by the power of your Savior. The Savior already beat it, and He's just sitting at God's right hand, helping us, aiding us, interceding for us, until the last day comes when death is destroyed, and everything about the devil is destroyed, and everything evil is destroyed, and that's the day when the kingdom of God is presented to the Father to be with Him in eternity. And then you have those descriptions in the book of Revelation about how it's going to be so nice there. No more death, no more sorrow, no more hunger, no more crying, no more sin, no more temptation, no more abominations around. All because of Jesus Christ, who is good, came to the world where He was tempted, but endured it without any sin, and therefore offered His sinless blood for mine so that I could have a chance to be in good for eternity I sure don't want to be in evil for eternity it's bad enough here isn't it let's be in goodness 
for eternity. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 1 John chapter 4 verse says. That's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1 27. But that's only if Christ is in you. And you know where it goes from here. The invitation that is always offered. It's always open at any time of day, any hour of the week, but we always emphasize it during our services. If you're not a Christian, you don't have that hope, and what awaits is the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Or if you're a Christian who's been sinning and unrepentant of that sin, you don't have that hope. You have the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So if you're not a Christian, become one. By confessing a faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, repenting of those sins genuinely, and being baptized for the remission of your sins. And if you are a Christian who's been sinning, then come back to God with humility, genuinely, in penitence, in prayer, in confession, and let Him know you want to be His and given to Him wholly again. If we can help you with either one of those things, would you please come forward as we stand and sing to encourage you. Jesus is calling, calling, calling. Jesus is.